Okay, this morning we have a, a, a start of something new. Uh, we are going to spend, uh, I'm going to be here, fortunately or unfortunately for you, I'm going to be here for the next six months, not the whole time, right? Once, uh, but we're going to run through a sermon series on the book of Daniel, right? Not the whole thing, but Daniel chapter 1 to chapter 6. And, and to just let you know what's happening before we go into the details, uh, is that we're going to talk about real faith in the real world, right? If you forget everything, just remember this idea. We hope that it will make sense by the end of this afternoon, which is, it is always easier to shout Amen on Sundays. Okay? Real faith in a real world. It is always easier to shout Amen on a Sunday morning. Right? What does it mean to live out our faith where it truly counts, where it's truly important for you to live out your faith? So basically, a quick overview. I, I want to make sure this is not a Bible class. I don't want to spend the whole time talking about this, but basically just a bit of an intro in case uh, some of you who are new or, or you're still like somewhere in Kings and have not touched prophets yet. Uh, again, we want to encourage everyone to read the Bible. Uh, yesterday, we were preaching in our church and we were just talking about the importance of doing devotion. Right? And we talked about the very first point right, is that there are people who do devotions very rigorously and very regularly. And there are people who don't do devotions, who don't read their Bible. And we say that at the end of the day, right, the starting point of all this is whether you truly believe every truth in the Bible is for your good. Right? If you're thinking, I read the Bible, the more I learn, the more I have to do, very high chance you will not read the Bible. Right? But if you truly believe, right, this is truly for my good. I want to know because I want to enrich my life. I want to live a fulfilling life. I want to be able to live life to the full. If it is truly for my good, then naturally, the more I want to read the Bible. Right? And, and this is what we want to encourage all of us. If you have not read through the book of Daniel before, you have six months. You have no excuse. You have six months. Read through the entire book of Daniel. Uh, if you can, we are, not, we are only going to preach the first part, but read through the whole book to have a sense of what the book is about so that as, even as we are preaching on the text, right, it is not the first time you have seen the book. Right? And, and basically a background, Prophet Daniel. Prophet Daniel is just a man we are most famous for the lion, right? uh, lion den. Uh, if you remember the three friends and the four men, that is not Daniel, that's his friends. Right? I'm, not even going to go, I'm not going to bother remembering their names. There's a lot of names there. But Daniel and the three friends, right? Daniel and the three friends. But he's most famous for the story about him with the, in the lion's den. Right? And what we know about him is just basic idea. He is supposed to be uh, someone of royal family. Later we'll talk about why on earth is he in Babylon. But he's somewhere, uh, a, a, a royal family, at least a little bit of noble blood. And he is supposed to be born somewhere near uh, the end of maybe five, six, seven hundred plus, and then he was basically taken to Babylon six oh five, right? Why? Later we talk about that. Uh, his name you can see. God is my judge, and he was given a local name, uh, which is all local name in most places. Like for example, right, if you have a, a Indian or Hindu friend, their name usually will have some God's name inside. Right? It's, it's just very natural in their ancient culture. So in Babylon, same thing. Right? You have your name, your name will have some name or some gods inside their name. Right? You cannot run away one. And that was his name. Uh, let that god protect his life. Right? Those is like, <laughs> he has two names. Right? And eventually we know that in the Bible, Jesus himself called him a prophet. He was not known to be a prophet very early. He was only known to be a prophet much later because a lot of things that you see in Daniel eventually came to pass. Uh, so you can imagine, right, originally when the book was kept in the scripture, among the Jewish scripture, the people was thinking like this, he was a great man, right? This is no doubt, he lived his life impeccably for like 60, 70 over years. Every Jew felt that he was a great man, but they also felt that the end of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 to chapter 12, all the like zoo and all the like Lord of the Ring kind of thing happening, ju -ju -ju fighting, fighting. Everyone was clueless about what's, how to understand the second half. Right? They kept the book because the first half was clearly his memoir, how he was a great man. The second half was totally clueless. Nobody knew what to do with the second half. So they kept the book and eventually right, they kept it under historical books. 
They didn't keep it under prophetic. They kept it under historical because they didn't know that he was a prophet. He like he writing so many things. We have no idea what he's talking about. But never mind. He's a great man. Okay, let's keep his books. And then eventually, what he mentioned, what he described, started to come to pass. Two, three, four hundred years later. Right by the time set one six seven plus one six seven BC, you're talking about almost three four hundred years later. Everybody was amazed that everything that was written, Daniel seven, Daniel eight, Daniel nine, Daniel ten, Daniel eleven, Daniel twelve, everything have came to pass. And then by that time, every Jew called him a prophet. And then when by the time Jesus came along, he was already well known to be a prophet. So Jesus himself called him a prophet. Right, so that's much later. But today we're going to look at his life, Daniel 1 to Daniel 6. We mentioned that he was brought to Babylon. Uh, it's a long way there. Uh, Babylon is a very interesting place because somewhere near Babylonia is where Abraham first came out. Now the people have to go all the way back in. Right? And they went all the way back. Basically, right, the reason why they have to go back is because Babylonia... They created an empire called Babylon Empire, Babylonian Empire, and they basically conquered, not say conquered, la, they rule over the entire place. Uh, just remember how they do it, right? Most of us who are of age, you will remember all the gangster movie Hong Kong, Gu Ho Zai, you all remember? Okay, basically that's how they take over the empire. They will send armies all over the place, send you a letter, hey, guess what? I give you two choices. You either pay, pay what? Protection money, also called tribute. Or next time when we come again, we will vandalize your shop. We basically, that's the same way. They do it the same way. They will send to all the people and everyone obviously submitted. And then it's okay, like, I pay, I pay, I pay. I will pay protection money. I will submit to you. And then now you are part of Babylonian Empire. You don't need to conquer one. You just send a letter. right? And then eventually Judah, okay, surrender, surrender. But part of the terms of that submission is that you must send your young children not all, your nobles. Okay, your noble, your royal family, the young children, you are under obligation to send some of the best to the capital city. Right? If it serves a, a few major functions. Those who have watched Korean drama before, you notice this kind of activity is done throughout ancient history. China, you do that. Korea, you do that. Everywhere they do that. Right? It does a few things. One, it creates brain drain. Because in the past, right, only people of royal family will be educated. Now I take all your educated young people and I bring to the capital. So suddenly, right, you have no young people who are educated in your country. Right? It created a brain drain. It is also intended to beef up the, the, the capability of the capital. Right? I get all the brightest people all over the place. I bring to the capital. Immediately, the capital becomes stronger. And the last most obvious thing that you can think of, you look at all your Korean Chinese drama, always do the same thing, man. What is the most obvious advantage of bringing your young people, your king's son, your king's nephew, everybody bring to the capital? Hostage. Political hostages. But of course, they are not going to mistreat you. They will say, I let you have a government post. I make you minister of so-and-so. I make you this so mixed. so I give you all the government position, but the government position must be done where? In the capital. I will not be so stupid to make you a government post and then send you back into the country. Right? I will make you have a government post, but in fulfill, to fulfill that role, you have to be in the capital. Suddenly, right, in my capital, in my government, in my parliament, I have all the young people of all the different parts. Anything happen? That is my hostage. Right? Political hostages. So Daniel was one of those among the bright and noble family, young people that was brought over to Babylon. So you're thinking at the time, right, best guess, they should be around 16 to 18. Right, you're not old because if you're too old, right, it's very hard to re-educate you. They're talking about, about maybe 16 to 18. 18 is the max. Most people think it's 16. Okay, about 16. So many of us over, over qualify already. Right, but, but, okay, anyway, this, this message should be preached in the youth group. It's 16 years old, right? And then they were brought over to Babylon, and the whole entire life of Babylon basically almost outlasted the entire empire. You can look at the blue color one, right? He went there 605, and he came back 3, he, he died, la, basically. He died at, three, at 538 BC. And then when you look at the, basically, when we talk about Daniel 1 to Daniel 6, you will see that Daniel 1 is right in the beginning. Daniel 6 is right at the end. By the time he finished his last recorded event, 
Daniel in the lion's den, he is already 80 plus years old. So you're not looking at some oh, Rambo, some muscular guy, oh, I'm not afraid of the lion. You are talking about someone right, who have done this faithfully for almost 60 over plus years. At the last stage of his life, he was being threatened when everybody's thinking, Ayah, and Moses just retire. Lah. He said, no, I'm going to do it one more time. Right? At 80, he did his very last act and he continued to remain faithful all the way to the end, so much so that he outlasted the entire empire. But the question is, right, why was the book of Daniel written? When you write a book, right, honestly, think about it. When you write a book, when could have the book been written? If the last recorded event in the book of Daniel is 3, 536 BC, right? When could he have written the book? Before or after that event? Must be after. So do you realize, right, the book was not written to the people of God when they were under Babylon? This is something that you have to remember. The book was written about Rebelon, right? But it was written to people who were under Persians. They were under the Persian Empire, and then Daniel wrote the book, but he wrote about his past, which is what happened when I was in Babylonia. So if you forget everything in this whole entire introduction, just remember this idea. The book was originally written to encourage the people of God under Persian Empire. I'm going to go. Right? Last time when I was around for the last 60 years, I was your beacon of courage. You, know, you can look to me. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, maybe I'm a faithful leader in the church. I'm a pastor in the church. I've been faithfully doing. So every time you have someone to look up to, say, wow, it's okay when I'm discouraged. I can always look to him. He will give me that courage. Daniel is saying, I can no longer do this. I'm 80. I'm going to go but I can write down what happened over the last 60 years so that hopefully, even when I'm going, even when I'm gone, when I, I can no longer physically encourage every one of you to persevere in your faith, maybe the story of my life can encourage you to persevere. I'm going to go. I survived the whole entire Babylonian empire. If you do the same, you will also survive the entire Persian empire that you will continue to live out your faith in the real world. You'll continue to live out your faith in the real world. And this is the whole entire theme of our entire book of Daniel 1 to 6, focusing only as how Daniel is going to account his life. We're not talking about his visions. We're focusing on how did he use his life to encourage the people in Persian Empire. How do you live your faith to ensure that you can even outlast the worldly influences, having real faith in the real world. And this will take six parts. Today will be the simplest. I hope, uh, I was telling the brother, right, let's do a test, you know. Next month when I come back, I will ask you, what was the sermon title? And then everybody like, what? Sermon title? What sermon title? <laughs> okay, but real faith in the real world, right? We're going to talk about real faith in the real world. Let us pray. And then we will commit this morning to the Lord. Father, I want to thank you for this morning as we come before you and each other. We are people of faith. Lord, we are not coming here because, oh Lord, that we just want to enjoy good music, enjoy good company. We came because we are and we continue to identify as people of faith. That we want to believe in you and that we want to learn how to live out what we mean when we say we believe in you. Lord, we pray that your word will continue to encourage us, your word will continue to inspire us and to renew our heart and mind within so that, Lord, we can truly live out our faith in the real world and therefore stand up in a way that would be truly be counted. And Lord, we want to thank you for each other. We pray, O oh Lord, that this word will be spoken forth in your strength, in your ability, in your wisdom, and in your love, Lord, so that your people will be built up for your work that you have given us. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Real faith in the real world. Right? What comes to your mind when you think about people of faith? What comes to your mind when you think about people of faith? Is it because they talk about God confidently? Oh, I'm God is! Then they, they must have a certain, certain tone to it. Oh, God is! Then, oh, I have a lot of faith. If someone comes along, God is. Okay, no faith. Is it about their confidence, their appearance of confidence? Is it their stories of signs and wonders? Like I've, I told you last time, this thing happened, that thing. Is it because I told you about what happened that makes me a man of faith? 
Is it their enthusiasm for ministry? Wow, I'm very excited for ministry. I have a lot of, I always say can, I never say cannot. Okay. Are those things you associate with when you think in your mind, okay, who is a man of faith in your life? What does it mean to have a man of Can real faith please stand up, right? In a time where many Christian leaders fell publicly, right? Recently, over the last few years, of course, granted, let's not get carried away. Christian leaders have fell throughout the centuries. It is only because last time got no internet, no social media. If some Christian leader fall, fell, fell, fell in Antarctica, nobody will know, right? Today, because of social media, it gives us an impression that is very regular. It's not as regular as we think. It still happens, but it is not because suddenly right, we are facing moral failure. But a lot of time it's really because social media makes it more visible. But reality is reality. Christian leaders whom we deem as men of faith, Christian leaders we, we often look up to, can fall. And then it makes us wonder, what does it really mean to have faith? Because this is a man I look up to precisely for his faith. And yet he fell. Then what does it mean for me when I say, I want to be a man of faith? What does it really mean to have faith? So today we're going to look at Daniel 1. And in Daniel 1, the story will work this way. Well, this is the whole entire setting, introduction of the whole story. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim into Ju of Judah into his hand. Right? And this is important because the Bible never says they lost. The Bible says God intentionally delivered. That means God made them lose in a way. God allowed them to lose. And therefore, along with some of the articles from the temple of God, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God. Right? This one, don't worry about it. Daniel chapter 5, you will see this. Right, the article will, will, be, will appear in the temple. Uh, background of why this happened. This is the ancient culture of when I am fighting, my God is also fighting your God. Okay, so this is a very primitive idea. Right, I have a God that is staying above me. You have a God that's staying above you. This is called the king of Israel. That is called the king of Babylon. Above the king of Israel is the God of Israel. Above the king of Babylon is the God of Babylon. As our armies are fighting, our gods and their armies are also fighting. So if we win, we plunder your treasury. But my God must also plunder your treasury. So we will go into your temple, get your article, take your idol, take some of the nice gold and stuff like that, and we will take it purposely to put it into our treasury? No, our temple, to show that our gods have plundered your God. And that's the reason why all those Jewish temples article is found in the temple. Right? It's a very ancient, very common culture. Right? And this is what happened. And we're going to look at, basically from now on, Daniel chapter 1, the whole entire story and the theme of Daniel chapter 1 is essentially real faith revealed. Real faith revealed. Deciding who you want to stand for. Over the next five weeks, we're going to talk about different ways where real faith will show itself. But this is the first time real faith revealed itself. Right? Real faith revealed. And when you look at the whole story, as we go through the story, as we slowly unpack, the very first thing you can see is that real faith has to be lived out in the world. Real faith is only meaningful if you can live it out and if you should live it out in the world. Real faith is not lived in the monastery. Real faith is not going to the desert and then forming our community and then trying to be faithful. Real faith is only meaningful if you can live it out in the world. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 7. As we saw the story just now, you can see that the king ordered his people to bring into the king's service, as we mentioned, some of these Israelite royal family, young men without physical default. Basically, they are able to be trained. They can be part of us. We can Chinese call Xi now. Right? Re-education is the word. We can re-educate them and bring them and make them part of us. We will give them our language, give them our food, give them our culture, make them go through our entertainment, make them do our scene, maybe. And over time, gradually, they will become part of us. 
and they will now my people. So that's what happened. That's what they did, and they chose some people. And the goal is to, as you mentioned, re-educate. The primary goal is that he was to teach them the language, literature, everything that the Babylonians believe. This is basically what you have today, right? Your social media, la, your advertising, la, all these things that our young people are bombarded. Even for us, when you scroll through, scroll through, the things that you see is constantly the world trying to teach you their language and their literature. Right? The goal is to see whether I can bring as many people to believe the Babylonian culture as possible. Today, we are still doing the same thing. The world is still doing the same thing, using media and social media and all your advertising. The king therefore assigned them a daily amount of food and wine, give them some benefit, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they will serve in the king's service. And this is in the context of how you find that three friends. Right? Very simple story to introduce the setting, but remember the setting of this whole thing was that who was the one who sent them there? The Babylonian king is the one who asked for them, but who was the one who allowed all this to happen? It was God. God sent them into the world. God sent them into the world. Because the reality as an intro to the whole entire setting is simply that it is very easy to live as a Christian in the church. How many of you right, have, don't raise your hand, don't look at one another, but how many of you have friends in this church even? Right? You know that when they talk among one another on a Sunday morning versus when they talk to their colleagues, you know that they don't talk the same way. Even. Or, wow, no vulgarity, very nice, praise the Lord. But then when they do other things, when they interact with their own colleagues, and then, wow, vulgarity, eh? how come different? Because the reality is it's always easier to live as a Christian in the church. Why? Because the reality is that social pressure is real, right? Social pressure is real. If you are the only one who is doing something in a group of, let's say there's 50, 100 people here, if you're the only one doing something in a group of, in a group of 100 people, you immediately will feel that I have to conform. So on a Sunday morning, are most people speaking vulgarity? No, you shouldn't, okay? So naturally, even if you want to, even you are still unsanctified, you naturally will conform. Right? Suppose you come to church and today you dress in a very inappropriate manner. Maybe you didn't know first time, right? You came, you are oh, And then the first time you came, hey, how come everybody dressed in a certain way? Immediately the next time you come, you instinctively will want to dress in a way that will not stand out. It's social pressure social pressure works everywhere you go right this is how you feel right when you're in the office and you have finished your work your time is up you could have gone home but all your other colleagues are doing ot then what do you do never mind i play game right? <laughs> don't go first why because social pressure works everywhere everybody is working they're doing ot you finish your work nothing to do but if I'm not, everybody not going, I'm going, is it very obvious? Will I stand out? You naturally will want to, maybe I just delay a little bit so that I go around that time. Instead of going exactly, I'll, I'll delay. Social pressure works everywhere. Our desire not to stand out will cause us to want to conform in one way or another. Right? And the reality is, on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning when we all gather, social pressure work to support you for godly living or to work against you for godly living? Support or work against? Support. That's why the Bible says, do not give up meeting one another and spur one another towards love and goodness because as we gather, we can help and spur and pressure in a good way, right? We can help one another live godly life because we have examples, we have, we have encouragement all over us and therefore, when we gather often, we have a tendency to want to live better lives, right? That's the whole idea of gathering together. Why do we have cell group? Why do we have a service? And why do we have fellowship? So that we can encourage one another. Social pressure used in the right way, right? But the unfortunate thing is, Social pressure work for you in a Sunday morning. But immediately on the Monday morning, it will turn and work against, unless you're working in the church office. 
<laughs> unless you're working in the church office. If not, right, once you go on a Monday morning, the social pressure now works the other way. Now you become a minority trying not to stand up. But real faith is only revealed if you could also live that same thing on a Sunday morning, also on a Monday morning. Real faith is only revealed if it can and should be lived out in the real world. John chapter 17, verse 11a to 15. Right? This is Jesus' prayer for the people. Interestingly, this is what Jesus said, I will remain in the world no longer. Right? And this is his prayer before he's about to be, ascend, uh, 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 to be crucified. He says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they, meaning his disciples, the church, will, re- will and they are still in the world. And I'm coming to you. Verse 15 further down says, My prayer is not that you will take them out of the world, but that you will just protect them through the evil one. And this is a very, very insightful statement because right from day one, God did not want us to be isolated from the world. If God wanted to keep you away from the world, I could have just brought you home. But God didn't. God left us in the world, but just say that I will protect you. He never said, I will remove you from the evil one. He says, I will just protect you through as you encounter the evil one. All the while, the original intent of God is to leave the church in the world, which means there is supposed to be relationships with the world. That means we shouldn't think about, oh, let me uh, form a monastery. Let me, everybody, all the Christians, let's gather. Let's go to the desert and live together. While you have a benefit of being easy to live your faith, but you will lose the meaning of having real faith. Real faith will, is meaningful. It's used, is meaningful only if you do it in the world. Right? Real faith is only meaningful if you do it in the world. Very quickly, right? So we will face both pressures to compromise as temptations also to conform in the world. It's reality. But our faith, as we mentioned, is only meaningful if it is still faith. That means our faith is meaningful only if, no matter where I go, it remains faith. It remains the same thing wherever I go, then your faith is meaningful. And this is the reason why the next thing very quickly, okay, the next thing is very quickly, is therefore faith as we are living out in the world, must resolve not to be of the world. You can see, right, this is the famous statement, in the world, not of the world. In the world, not of the world. It all came from then, from John chapter 17, that we are left in the world, but we are not of the world. You cannot be, oh, I'm not of the world, I leave the world. Cannot. You must remain in the world, but you must also commit not to be of the world. Two things happening at the same time. So real faith must first live out in the world and at the same time commit not to be of the world. You can imagine, right? You must understand the context, right? These are 16-year-old boys. Look at your, your youth group on the other side. 16-year-old only. They are not like, wow, many of us are battle-hardened Christians, right? You have gone through many things. These are 16-year-old boys or 17 who have probably gone through youth group like us, our young people. They've gone through training, they have have read the Bible, they have worshipped God, but now they are facing the real test of their life. What will happen if I take the people of faith who have lived out their Christianity, their Judaism, all the while in Judea? What will happen if I take them and I put them in Babylon? Do you realize the only reason? How many people did they take take from, from Judah all the way to Babylon? A lot, right? The Bible never says three or four. How many do you know? Only four. Make a guess why you only know about the four of them. Make a guess. Why do you only know about Daniel and the four friends? Why do you not know about the other people? Chances are, the rest, compromise. Chances are, the rest have already compromised. These four are the beacon of hope for the entire people that these four did not compromise. They are heroes of their faith and they were encouragement to them. It is not easy. These are talking about 16 years old. This is basically how our, our young people feel when they go to school and they're being pressured about social issues. They say, oh, you are Christians. Huh? How come you all do this? And the ability to say, no, I'm not just saying those things in church. I'm continuing to say those things. I know I'm wise. I know how to say, but I continue to hold the same belief even if my whole class pressure me against it. I'm going to continue to stand that way. 
it takes a lot. Can you imagine right, what must have happened in Judah for them to build their faith in such a way that you have a hundred maybe of them going over and only four managed to stand firm? It's obviously not easy. It's obviously not easy, but real faith must resolve to be not of the world. And you read of Daniel in this regard. Daniel chapter 1, verse 10, verse 8 onwards, he says, But Daniel resolved, he decided not to defile himself not to be defiled himself with the royal food and wine. We don't know why he thinks that way. Very, there's a lot of possible reasons, right? And we are not here to speculate the reason. Very likely is that this food, I have no control, safer, eat vegetable, right? Because all the clean, unclean, all the things, if I take one, I have to take all. Why not? I don't take anything. I will just eat vegetable, right? We are not, obviously, this is not talking about vegans, right? Or vegetables are better. It is not talking about that. But most likely is his fear that if I take the food from them, eventually I will be totally subsumed under their culture. This is my last area where I can make my stand. And he decided to do that, right? And eventually he decided to say, why not? I know you are worried whether we will go malnourished, we will not look good. Okay, why don't you test us? We will only eat vegetables, right? We will not take your food. Let us decide what we can decide. And then they test. Then it says, okay, maybe a few days, a few months later, you come and see, test your page, test your servant, give us 10 days. We'll eat this and see whether we are stronger or we are weaker. If you are weaker, then fine, then I eat your food. If I turn out to be stronger after eating this for, for 10 days, then you let us continue doing this. Again, don't go back and say, therefore, don't use this text, please, to, to tell your children, please eat your vegetables. Okay, this is not talking about that. Okay, but at the end of the day, right, it clearly represents the fact that God has strengthened them. Because you must understand, in the ancient world, they don't have such a concept whereby eat vegetables, you'll go healthy. Right, they obviously think that you grow thick meat, you will grow buffy, buff, right? But... Somehow God did a miracle. They ate only vegetables, plain water, and yet they grew up very healthy. And eventually the God took away all their choice food and wine and gave them only vegetables. Daniel stood firm. Daniel stood firm and resolved. But this is very interesting because, right, you are just told that Daniel had a Babylonian name with a lot of gods in it. He has a name, we have a God. He said, hey, I thought you want to resolve not to be of the world. Why do you have a name with a, with a pagan God inside? Right? This is like our Bible, New Testament classic example, Apollos. Apollos came from Apollo. Apollo is a God. It's a Greek God and his name is Apollos. He's, he's honoring a Greek God. Right? And these are things right, that at the end of the day, when we live out our faith, in the world, there are lines we have to learn to draw. Right? We are not, we are not talking, we are not asking you, right? Oh, everybody, when you live out in the world, you just you just do your own thing, don't care about the world. There are some things you have to engage. Like for example, as far as Daniel was concerned, okay, you want me to learn your literature, I learn. You want me to learn your language, I okay, because I don't I can't choose in those, right? You give me a name, I don't have a choice. This is your language, you're calling by my name. You call, you want to call, I can don't respond, but what's the, what's the point? This name doesn't mean anything to me. But what I can decide, I want to decide. So Daniel has this tension. He actively resisted the pressure to conform when he really thought that those conformity, those conforming parts, those compromise will actually com- pressure him to conform to the world and values of the world. But when there are things that's trivial, uh, yeah, just a name only, doesn't matter. It won't mean anything. When there are trivial things, he just engage. So, fine, I can do all this. There are things we engage. There are things we refuse. This wisdom, this calls for a lot of wisdom. Because in the world, right, we often sometimes hear of this phrase that say, oh, we need to be relevant to the world in order to present the gospel. We have to ask ourselves, right, is it really true? Is it really true? Because the early church was well known to be a church that is not relevant. And yet, the early church continued to remain the fastest growing church in the world by statistics, like double every 50 year kind of thing. The whole world population, Christian, double almost like end bar. They are under persecution, understood and seen as irrelevant. They don't join activity, they don't attend this, they don't attend that, they don't join people. And yet, 
they grew as the fastest growing church in the world without being relevant. We have to ask ourselves, what do we mean when we say relevant? Sometimes, right, we, if we are not careful, we use the word relevant because we compromise. We compromise on things and we mask it by saying we are trying to be relevant. What does it mean to be relevant? Engaging when it's trivial, but resisting when it forces us to conform. All this requires a lot of courage and wisdom. Right? It is not something easy. Sorry, it's not something easy. Right? You need to have a lot of courage. That means if no means, no. For example, one of the things that our young people constantly will one day or today even have to deal with is our understanding and belief about sex. Because the Christian ideals and belief about sex, sexuality, not just homosexuality, all things sexuality, is very different from what the world is telling our children. It's very different from what their friends are telling them. I told you before, I think last time I mentioned before, we have a celebrity, a very young celebrity, about maybe late 20s in our church. And he used to, sh he's a youth leader. His, his wife is the youth pastor. And they used to share openly in their, in, their, in their gathering how because he's a celebrity, young star, young, young actor, constantly being laughed at by their celebrity colleagues. Huh, you're still a virgin. Uh. Yeah, please. La. Yeah, don't need to be so, so, so strict. One, uh. You're so old already. You're getting married. Wow. Why you're so... And constantly under that pressure because everywhere... And they are not meant to make fun of them. They are just thinking that he's very strange. Because in that whole world, if you know, right, the celebrity media culture is a little bit, a bit more relaxed <laughs> compared to a lot of other places. And he just, why are you holding on to this? You know, as an actor, do you know how available opportunities will be for you? And he resisted. And he constantly had to answer questions about why as a 20 plus, 26, 28, before they got married, why as a 20 plus years old, actor, handsome, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of fans, a lot of people throw themselves, and yet why at that point in time he was still keeping himself sexually pure because that's what he believed. And this is what our young people will constantly go through. You need courage because the whole world will think very differently from you. And yet at the same time, you want wisdom to know there are battles, there are some battles that don't need to fight one. There are some things like, for example, I mean, and I'll throw one up, please don't stone me. Uh, like, wow, whether you should be vaccinated. To me, I uh, don't need to fight one. These type of things are trivial. Compared to things about sex, sexuality, homo, uh, abortion, there are a lot of things more serious that we need to engage. How we think about education, what we think about... There are some things in life that's a lot more important that we cannot compromise. There are some things that are trivial, doesn't really matter. Don't fight battles that don't need to be fought and fight battles that require us to fight so that as a Christian, we can show the world that we really know what we are talking about. It takes courage. Faith must resolve not to be of the world. John chapter 17 Verse 14, it says, I've given you your word. I've given them, Jesus said, you've given the church your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Right? The world eventually, as we are living not of the world, the world will love you or hate you. If you be honest, if you take the scripture seriously, those who want to live a godly life will be persecuted. They are not of the world, even any more than I am not of the world. The moment we live in such a way, there will be pressure. The pressure is supposed to be normal. At the end of the day, right, as a Christian, remember we are not trying to get people angry. We are not trying to make people don't like us. But the fact is that when you live in a different way, you will invite that kind of hostility. It's not something you want. It automatically happens as part of our Christian identity. That's why Romans 12 verse 2 Encourage Christians not to be conformed to the pattern of the world. The very starting of your Christian faith, before you talk about, oh, you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? Remember this? This is before telling you you should be changed, you should change this, you should change that, you should, you should not do this, you should not do that. Before all that, the very first thing in your mind is do you believe that I don't need to be like the world? 
Do you believe that I don't have to be like my cousins who are not a Christian? I don't have to live my life like the way my colleagues does. I don't have to parent my kids like my kindergarten kids' other friends' parents. I don't have to do it like them. I don't have to feel ashamed if I ever do things different from them. I don't have to feel ashamed because I am not supposed to conform to the pattern of the world. I still remember right, my quick story right there. When I, I just remember last yesterday that when, when my kids, my two older ones, 14, they are now 16 and 14, when they were younger in primary school, right, we are very strict about them right, being, take, make, making, taking our uh, instructions seriously. Right, you know as parents, hey, say A, hey, A, yeah, never mind, never mind, la. Papa, Mama won't punish one. And one of the things that is, we are very strict about is we want them to be independent so that when they, they, in the morning right, they do their own things, they get ready and they go for school. One day, don't wanna, don't wanna. Ask them quickly go to school, late, ready, ready. Don't wanna, lemme, lemme, got time, got time, got time. Cross the time. We bar them from going to school. That day, right, they were at home, they were at the door. Papa, I want to go to school, I want to go to school. I said, nope, sorry, you, you, you exceeded the time. You clearly know there was a time that you had to leave the house. And you passed that time and you're still doing, you clearly did not. The issue is not the time. The issue is you clearly took our instructions for granted. You did not respond. We already mentioned, we reminded, we reminded, and you take our instruction very lightly. Our thinking is if they could do something like this on such a trivial matter, what would they take our instruction on serious matters? Right? So, okay, since you, consequence, right? We said already, you miss the time, you don't go to school. Miss the time, don't go to school. The teacher immediately wrote back, why are they not in school? And we re responded. We wrote them the email explaining what happened. And the teacher said, oh, sure, no problem. Just try not to do it again. <laughs> and to us, right, no problem. And we mentioned this to some of our friends. And guess what our friends mentioned? Huh? How can you let them miss school? Do you know that they will miss out on the whole day's learning? What if they cannot catch up how? What if they miss this? Uh, yeah, what, if, what if they set back? Then the whole subject, they will, they will not be able to follow. Then they don't know this, don't know that. See, does it really matter? Honestly, does it really matter whether they know how to do algebra compared to whether they honour, they understand what it means to honour your parents and its instruction? Which one is more important to you? You mean really knowing all this in school one whole day really make a big difference? We're not saying it's not good, lah, not important. We're saying compared to the other, is it really that important? But everyone we told, Christians, lah, my cell group members, everyone, no, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't do. But in reality, sometimes our values, we conform more like a world. The Bible says the first thing is not to conform to the pattern of the world, to decide that once I'm a believer, to be holy means that I will be different. I already know that if I try to live out my faith, I will or will not be different. Will be different. You can even tell yourself that. Am I prepared to live out my faith? If yes, then the automatic conclusion is at one point or another, you will be different than the world. And that difference will cause you to have tensions in life. Right? So it is often easier, very quickly, it's often easier to respond to God, as we mentioned, on a weekend service. But our real faith will only show itself on a Monday morning. It's easy to say, God, I trust you on a Monday, on a Sunday morning. Will you still say amen to the same thing once Monday comes? It's easy to say, I will live this way. And then your colleagues come along. Will you still continue to say, God, I've said my amen on a Sunday I will now leave out my amen on a Monday. What you proclaim on Sunday, you start leaving out on a Monday. That is real faith. Is your amen still applicable on Sunday? Very quickly, this one we will just run, run through. We are not going to cover this because the whole entire rest of the book is basically about this. Real faith eventually will be used to influence the world. Because if you look at the whole text, right, the rest of the chapter, after telling you what Daniel did, which is precisely trying to encourage you to say, this is the reason why of all the people, why he managed to last 60 years. Because he started that way. He started by saying, God, I will not conform. I will resolve not to be like the world. And for that on, the rest of the passage is a summary actually. So your chapter 1 right, is a summary of the whole book. The rest of these chapters basically summarizes what happened after that for the next 60 years. It says, 
to these four men, only four, God gave knowledge, understanding of all kinds, God equipped them, and Daniel could understand dreams and visions. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them, they talked to all the different people, and these four stood out. Right? These four stood out, and therefore they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding. Everything that they do, they are always better than everybody else. This is not saying that everyone will be better, but that God purposely rolls them for some purposes. And at the end of the day, this is the most important statement. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus is the king of Persia. He's the king of Persia. He outlasted the entire empire. He stood faithful, resolved not to be like the world, and he lived out his faith. Did he change the empire overnight? No, it took 60 over years. The empire changed. Now we are still struggling, but he outlasted the entire worldly influence of his time. We are now living through a lot of worldly influences. Right? As we remain faithful, some of us could even outlive all these negative influences, worldly influences that our children are going through. But it required us to have real faith. God was actively at work. God equipped them, God raised them, and God sustained them for a long haul. It is easy, right, to be like, oh, make a noise here, say something here. It is difficult to last 60 years and to have that same faith for 60 years to do the thing that God wants you to do. God works His purposes through His people, but not all kinds of people. I'm very sure when we make that statement, you could imagine, you can think of people in your life that has been there for a long time and that God used them to do amazing things for the church or for you. God used people of faith for His redemptive purposes. Just two passages to end off. It says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans. Basically, right, in today's li our lingo, Leave your faith, your real faith out among people without faith. Leave such amazingly faith-filled life among the people who don't believe in God so that they may accuse. They can, that means as you're doing that, will they like you? The text say, they will accuse of all the wrong things. Ah, yeah, you are like that, lah. you're narrow-minded. They can accuse you of all the things. It will not change it. It will not be because you live such good life and they suddenly, wow, you're so nice, uh, I shouldn't say all these things. They will continue to accuse you of doing wrong. But at the end, if you last longer than them, if you persevere and you keep on living such good lives among them as they are accusing you of all the wrong things, then they may see your good deeds, eventually they see your whole life and they will eventually glorify God on the day He visits. That means, right, there is a high chance that many of you or many of your friends will one day come back, come to God because of how lasting your faith had been. I'm sure, right, maybe for some of us it's the reverse. There are some people in your life, right, that you, when you were non-Christian, you tekan them, tekan them, tekan them, tekan them, tekan them, now you're sitting here. They have, their perseverance have outlasted your persecution, right? You purposely go and swan all your friends, like question them, question their faith, make it difficult for them. And their perseverance and living out their faith outlasted your own persecution. And in the same way, the Bible says, live such good life as Christians. Live such good lives in a world that is not going to support you living a godly life. Right? The world will not support you. The church supports you to live a godly life. The world will not. As you live amazingly godly life, the world will continually add pressure to you. But then, for many of the people around us, right, your godly living may really outlast their persecution, provided that we persevere. We'll skip this. So people of faith are needed, as the Bible mentioned, that people of faith is needed to impact the world. The question is really just whether we are ready to be counted. So Daniel 1 is just a summary of the entire life of Daniel, telling us that how Daniel was forced to live as a 16-year-old, to force to live out his faith in the pagan world. And right from day one, he said, no, I will not compromise. I will live out my faith. 
And because he did that, eventually God used him. He became, for those who know the story in the future, right? He became almost like the third in command. Right? Third in command because you, the, the highest position a foreigner, uh, not a foreigner, a, a highest position a non prince can take is the third highest position. Always. Why? Because your crown prince will take the hard second. You, your crown prince, and the next highest position that is not a prince is actually the third highest position. And Daniel, for two different places, took the third highest position in the world, in the empire at that time. God used him mightily to influence his world. But that was because he actually resolved to be in the world, not of the world, and therefore God used him to influence his world. So for many of us, this is something we need to consider as we prepare ourselves for the next five weeks. As we mentioned, uh, this, this passage today right, is not really, doesn't have a lot of things for us to think about. It's really just to set the entire uh, setting for the entire sermon series. Right? Famous passage. You're the sword, you're the light. You're the sword, you're the light. What happens if you are sword but not salty? Then you are not called a sword. What happens if you are people of faith but you don't have faith? What happens if you are light but you don't shine? Then you are not a light. And for that reason, the Bible says, let our light shine. Let us live out our faith. So even as we wrap up this whole entire message this morning, maybe invite the worship team to come forward and maybe we'll just respond right, with a simple worship and just a reminder for every one of us that the reason why we live out our faith is because our faith is placed on a real God. You have real faith because you have a real God. If your God is not real, right, you cannot have real faith. You have sincere errors you have real faith because you have a god that is truly real and you believe in a god that is real you believe in a god that is real let us pray let us worship this morning let's stand together let's stand together let us really spend this time to come to god and to worship him and to remind ourselves of why we have this faith in the first place. Why do we want to live out this faith? Knowing that living out our faith in the world is difficult. Why? Because God is real and has been real in each and every one of our lives. That is the only foundation that could have helped Daniel persevere for 60 years as a 16-year-old kid. Because God had been real in Judah. So he believed God will be real in Babylon. And let us pray and remember that our God is of God that is real and that is faithful. Let's pray. Let's pray. Brothers and sisters, as we come this morning, let us respond to God in a very simple manner. Let us just put our hand on our heart today, this morning. Let us pray for ourselves. Let this morning response be a time where we pray for our own hearts. Specifically for two groups of people. Maybe for some of us, as you're praying for your own heart, maybe you have been trying very much to live out your faith wherever you are, either in your work, in your school, even in your family, sometimes even in your own cell group. You have been trying very hard to live out what you, what you believe that you should as a believer to inspire the people around you. And it has not been easy. And today we want for this group of people to pray that you will pray for your heart, that you will pray for perseverance. You pray for God to strengthen your heart that just like Daniel outlasted the Babylonian Empire, you pray for your heart, God, strengthen my heart. Renew my strength so that I too will outlast all the negative influences, all the pressures and all the persecution I'm receiving. Lord, pray for my heart to be strengthened 
that my friends will look at my life and they will turn that I will outlast their jeering I will outlast their slander I will outlast the ostracism that I get but give me a heart Lord that will continue to persevere and another group of people that we also want to pray for our own hearts is that if you're honest about it as you're listening this morning and you're thinking through some of the things that were said truth be told that even as you sometimes look at your own life and you compare that to your friends around you friends who do not know God and sometimes you do feel a sense of shame of guilt of wondering why my life looks so much like them why my life appear so much similar that I often respond to things the same way that I react in the same manner that I pursue the same things I treasure the same things that they treasure I have the same agenda I have the same priorities I behave the same way and sometimes as you are looking and you are evaluating your own life you can sense God's voice speaking to you my son my daughter do not conform to the pattern of this world so that you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind that as you're thinking through the God is inviting you to pray for your heart because for some of us maybe if you're honest you did not start that way when you first came to know the Lord you were excited you were on fire but living in Babylon can do something to you when we first encounter God it is easy to feel excited in our Judah but living in Babylon with all the choice food with all the literature with all the things that's advanced that's appealing living in Babylon can sometimes do things to us and today as you hear the voice of God encouraging you and you are wondering will I have to make drastic changes in my life why not we let God settle that in the future this morning we will just pray for our heart and we will just pray if you, this is your situation that you will pray for yourself say God help me renew my commitment renew my commitment to live out my faith I know in the future I may make decisions that will be difficult but I will leave that in the future because your strength will come to me when I need it your wisdom will come to me when I need it in the future but this morning I will just pray for my heart Lord soften my heart give me a new heart that wants to live out my faith all I ask for is a new heart a heart that wants to live out my faith in the real world and Father we want to pray for every one of us this morning whether people who have been persevering or people who need to turn back to you and Lord today we pray you called us here this morning to hear your word because you want us to live out our faith we want us to have genuine meaningful faith that can be lived out in the real world and Lord we pray even as we turn ourselves to you and we draw strength from you Lord each and every one of us will be used by you to influence the world around us even among our colleagues in our family Lord you will use each and every one of us to make an impact to the people who needs to hear your message and Lord we pray and we thank you for the many people who will be turned to the gospel because of our lives and we give thanks in all this we pray in Jesus name